Thanks, Marisa. Uh, and thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, as Marisa did mention, um, today's uh, presentation is meant to be very interactive. We have several questions, poll questions that we'll ask throughout. Um, and you'll see that pop up as a poll for you to actually click and we'll collect responses that way. But there'll be several other chances for you to participate. Um, and so if you could use that chat panel um, to do that, that would be fantastic. One request there, um, the default in the chat panel is to send your responses just to us, just to the panelists. If you could hit that little drop down and just choose panelists and attendees so we can all kind of see and participate um, and, and everybody can kind of see what everybody else is doing, that will be uh, best, I think, for interactivity. So just a little drop down box um, and uh, that would be great. Uh, so uh, the reason we're, we're here today, uh, we've actually been working on this book that's almost but not quite done. Uh, we will release this very soon. But um, you know, the, the folks uh, Ben and I here at Sneak engaged with Engineer Better to help write this book about uh, infrastructure as code and treating infrastructure as code really as code, uh, the way that uh, other application code is uh, is treated. We've had conversations with a with a bunch of customers. Uh, Engineer Better goes out and does you know implementations and helps um, and works with with uh, with people's engineering teams on cloud native transformations. And at Sneak, we work on you know helping people create secure applications uh, and making security part of a developer's you know day to day uh, work. And we wanted to combine those two things. We talked to a lot of customers um, and potential customers who. You know, they all, everybody knows that infrastructure as code has been around for a while. That it, you know, as a as a technology, it's not new. But a lot of companies are still formalizing their practices around infrastructure as code and starting to sort of centralize on one or two different flavors of infrastructure as code and figuring out how to really treat that as if it is an application. And so we wanted to write this book as a bit of a guide for that. We really cover speed and security as sort of the two guiding principles for infrastructure as code. Um, and there are a whole host of practices that go into, uh, into those things. So we're really excited about this book. Today's presentation is going to cover a handful of those practices. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more depth as we go through this. We'd love to get your feedback. That's where the interactivity will come in through here. And we'll send this uh, link out to this book when it is published. If you're, you know, if you're attending today, you'll get that link, you know, assuming you've opted in for follow-ups. Um, so just as a warm-up and kind of get people um, that uh, get, get people going in the chat panel and those kinds of things. Um, if you could, uh, just in the chat panel real quick, type in you know, your, your biggest obstacle that you're facing right now with implementing infrastructure as code. And this is wide open, you know, anything that you want um, to, to type in. It could be your personal obstacle. It could be an obstacle that you know, your company as a whole is facing. Um, so, uh, so just let us know there. Uh, yeah, technical problems, uh, political problems, strategic problems, knowledge problems, uh, open to hear everything there. Yeah, yeah experience and uh, confidence problems, often ones I find come up a lot as well. Yeah, seeing a lot of sharing and testing, knowledge seems to be um, one. One one man team. Not, not entirely sure I want it yet. <laughs> that's 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 you know that's definitely a, a you know an obstacle I think, uh, and in a, a good consideration. I'm not laughing because it's a it's a bad thing. It's it's definitely something that I think everybody should consider. Uh, lacking experience and time, global adoption. So that sort of centralizing lack of consistency. So we're seeing several of those things. Um, there's a bit of a theme here as well, Jim, I think around like testing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Testing best practices, that lack of knowledge, secrets. Those are all, um, you know, several things that are, that are listed around there. So yeah, not, not uh, completely surprising. Um, we actually ran before we did the book uh, back at the end of sort of middle to end of last year, Sneak ran a poll, ran a survey actually um, externally, not just to Sneak customers. We ran it through a third party to kind of ask, folks with their, where they are in their implementation journeys with IAC and what they're running into. And their, their answers were very similar to these as well. So, you know, it continues to be uh, a problem, I think. Um, I see a couple of people too say it's, you know, it's a one man team. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you do all this when there's just one person? 
Uh, so great, that's great. You know, we're going to talk about several of these things as we go through this um, this presentation um, today. So let's go with with an actual uh, poll question here. I've got it on the screen, but I'm going to actually use the built-in polling function here, um, so we can collect answers in a little more formal way. Um, what source code management or version control system get you know, like thing, are you using today uh, with IAC? If you're using anything, and we've seen everything. We've seen people who have nothing. They're just, you know, they have it on their system and that's it. We've seen people who have shared folders. We've seen people with various Git-like things uh, that they're using. This is a, you know, not a surprising set of responses coming in here either. I think most people are leaning towards some sort of Git repo, which is good. I think that's a great first step. I think in the book we talked about that. Ben or DJ, any any thoughts there? How many people do you see that are still using just like shared folders or some old sort of like old school sharing method? I see a worrying number of people who aren't using anything at all. Um, the number of kind of lone wolves there are out there that are responsible for one corner of a system somewhere that have, you know, stood it up on their laptop, they're storing their Terraform state locally, uh, they're the uh, single point of failure. Uh, we used to talk about the bus factor, but we prefer to talk about the lottery factor. If that person wins the lottery, then all of their knowledge in their state uh, goes away. That's something that... Uh, uh, I see quite a lot of. I think one of the encouraging things is that if people are into things like infrastructure as code, they're likely to be in a forward thinking sort of organization where they're more likely to be using something like Git um, rather than Subversion, for, for example, with one of the kind of older uh, VCS uh, solutions. I think you, uh, you make a good point there, Dan, though. It's not just the version control of the Terraform files themselves, it's also keeping hold of that state file as well. And uh, slightly sad for it, but very important kind of concerns here. You need to have uh, the right mechanisms in place to handle both. Yeah, I think, and I think know, another thing that, that kind of came up in the book that's interesting too, there's a, you know, a, a couple of people here who said that they're kind of a one person shop. I think even for, for that, like having in Git and having that history, knowing what's changed and being able to go backwards and look at what you did in the past is still a reason, you know, even if you're not sharing it with anybody that you might want to have it in a, in a system like this. Absolutely. And I think, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing this as Robert uh, Strand um, makes the point of, of get your IAC uh, config into source control, uh, even if you are working on your own. Um, can't recommend that enough. My other half um, is a interior architect and she does lots of stuff with AutoCAD and Photoshop. And there's no version control. I'm like, how, how do you do this? How do you work on big complicated projects without being able to make commits and have branches and being able to undo your changes? Um, and similarly, uh, with, with her, I'm working on kind of a, a barn conversion. And I'm having to do DIY for the first time. And it scares the hell out of me that I can't undo things. Like if I'm cutting a piece of wood, there is no git revert on that. So having th that, uh, if, if there are any folks here who uh, maybe are more from the operator side and less in the development space and haven't got uh, down and dirty with git, the, the barrier of entry you know, is quite a learning curve because there's 15 ways of doing any one thing in git, but I would highly, highly recommend it. And in terms of the approach and some of the other practices that we'll talk about later, it's it's fundamental and this this goes into um you know when we're talking about applying this stuff continuously um that's you know really uh, uh requires having your your isc config somewhere that's uh, remotely accessible and, and shared but also when we start talking about security and compliance a lot of regulations and um policies policies i should say rather than regulations were written before there was an assumption that everything would be uh, stored in a durable shared format that can be tamper proof. So if you go to maybe a uh, more enterprisey sort of organization where they're expecting ops to be happening manually and you tell them, well, actually I can show you every single config change that's ever happened to this system. It's only being applied by a CI server. Everything else is locked down. So I can prove who did it, when they did it, what they were aiming to achieve. Um, and we can undo it, all of a sudden that becomes a, a kind of revolutionary um, capacity, uh, capability for them. And often those policies that 
folks will point to as if they're etched in stone um, and, and can't possibly change or challenge become mutable and you're like okay now we can do things differently because technology has moved on since you wrote that document how do we um kind of building on that Fred Dan, like how do we feel about mono repos for all of your infrastructure for your, all of your organization's infrastructure in one place for example because it that by definition meets everything you've just articulated that it's in git this version you can kind of revert it but there might be 10 teams who live in there Oh, you dive straight into the controversial ones. That's an excellent question. Um, I'll be honest. Every so, Engineer Better does uh, some consultancy work with, with some customers where we go in where there's development dysfunction, it takes too long to get things into production uh, or develop them around low. In a lot of cases, majority of cases we get called into, a mono repo is part of the problem. Um, and it incentivizes uh kind of bad behavior and depending on things when maybe you really shouldn't and tight coupling of things you d that's not say that you have to do those things when you use a mono repo by which you know we mean one massive version control repository with everything in it but mono repos were pioneered by folks like google who had a whole team dedicated to writing tooling to make that work and most enterprises do not have that team. So I'd question whether that's, uh, you really need to look at whether you're getting the benefits from it and what it's doing to things like the, your lead time to production, how quickly you can get changes out and how your flow efficiency. So how much time you're spending waiting on things and dealing with merge requests and internal communications rather than just getting code and throwing it down the pipeline. Yeah, I asked in the chat panel too how many people are using. And we've got a few few people that are going with the mono mono repo route in some places where it's where it varies a little bit. So it's definitely out there. We see it. I mean, we see it in our customers, you know, a bunch uh, as well. So it, I think it might vary by format a little bit too. I, I think you know Terraform is one of those where we see maybe more often people are using a mono repo. Kubernetes, maybe if you consider that, we consider that infrastructure as code. Um, so if you consider that, I think that tends to be a little more divided. Um, I guess it could depend on which aspect of Kubernetes you're talking about too. I think other other formats, I wonder if cloud formation is a little more splittable versus Terraform having everything together, I'm not sure. I think one of the things to fall back to here is the uh, package cohesion principles. So I spent the early part of my career as a Java developer for my sins. Um, and uh, go have a look on Wikipedia about uh, package cohesion principles, but things like rules of uh, things that change together, stay together. Um, really, you want to be looking at the boundaries of, of what's um, kept in the same location. You shouldn't have two different reasons for changing uh, one set of files. Um, I'd also, to the mono repo point, I mean, something that I do see working well is when there is a product, we're quite big into platforms and building platforms. If there's one thing that represents your, uh, maybe a SaaS offering, um, having that in a repo is a kind of a repository per product. Um, that seems to work well in, uh, in my experience. So I, I suppose it depends on how many things your organization does. If you've got things that are completely unrelated, um, all living in the same repository, then uh, I would uh, certainly invite folks to, to, to check the metrics, to see whether that's working well for them or whether it's creating problems that maybe are otherwise hidden. Yeah, I think the other thing we'd ask here too, we'll, we'll kind of move on, but I think it's interesting too with IAC to think about the fact that you have different things that you might want to store, right? So the code, we asked about, you know, Git repos and things, but also IAC specifics. I think with something like a Terraform, again, you have you have the state that has to be stored somewhere and Git repos may not be the best place for that. Um, maybe use a Terraform thing or maybe you have something else that you use to store it. But I think there's other considerations there too that are, that are kind of important that might split, split the things up, even if they are related. As we go on, um, I'm not sure if I'm using Zoom correctly. The results in the poll, how many people weren't using version control at all? We're not using it at all. It was very small. So out of the, the, the total, we had 100 and something odd people that voted and only nine, 12 responses. Well, actually only nine responses were not using some sort of actual version control system. Cool, and that's encouraging. Of, yeah, three of those were using shared, shared folders. I don't know who, so I'll, I'll 
keep the anonymity there for the people using shared folders. All right, let's go on to question number two. Um, so, you know, if you do have these things uh, in uh, in in some sort of version control in Git, or or I guess you could do this other ways too. But, you know, what types of automated tests do you run uh, as engineers update the code? So, as people make changes to infrastructure of code and code gets committed uh, to wherever you're committing it, what types of um, you know testing are you running? On that that was one of the things that came up uh, in terms of um, you know, an obstacle to, uh, to adoption of IAC and really to sort of broadening the use of IAC. So kind of curious what types of tests people are running um, if you're running uh, tests today. We've got several options here. So simple things like linting, um, just looking for style errors and syntax errors and sort of kind of, kind of getting to a point where you're coming up with a common sort of uh, way of writing that and sort of enforcing that with, with some automated testing. There's, there's loads of ways you can validate your IAC. Each format tends to have, you know, kind of either some sort of built-in uh, testing or there are open source tools and other tools that you might use um, to validate that you're actually writing IAC that is runnable, <laughs> deployable. Um, security tests. Um, this is our shameless plug. I think it's the only shameless plug we have in the polls uh, for something like Sneak IAC, which will do security uh, and misconfiguration tests. But I think you know, obviously, in our opinion, that's an extremely important uh, thing to include somewhere in your IAC pipelines. Uh, there's loads of other tests you could you could uh, you could be using. If you do run other tests that we don't have listed here, if you could pop those into the um, chat panel, just so we can kind of see what people are doing. Um, and if you're not doing testing, that's an option too. Oh, I've got to say, if you occasionally hear a very loud click coming from my microphone, it's my ankle of all things. When I'm shifting my weight, my ankle is making a very loud clicking noise. So uh, I'll try not to do that. That doesn't sound pleasant. But thankfully, it's not painful. Um, but yeah, with, with testing, I mean, I suppose this is one of the, it would be interesting to um, hear from the folks on the webinar, how many people have come from a software engineering background and how many people have come from a more ops and kind of sysadmin background. One of the things that we see more in teams that have uh, been application developers in the past is that there's a propensity to shift left by which we mean move quality checks and try and fail fast. So as soon as you've written a line of code, um, or a, you know, made a config change, how quickly can you find out that was the wrong thing um, rather than leaving it all the way to making some deployments and then running some big integration tests or even worse, uh, making changes in production and then finding out that uh, your users have discovered that you, you've got a misconfiguration. Yeah, I think um, hopefully everybody can see the poll results here. So Lenting came up as the number one, uh, not surprising, right? I think that's that's a pretty common thing. It can be built in in a number of places as well. Um, lots of lots of IAC validation and lots of people who are not doing much testing yet either. Um, so I think that kind of echoes what we what we saw in kind of that very first warm up question about obstacles to um, you know to adopting IAC you know at a, at a bigger level. Um, not much uh, in terms of in terms of percentages at least. Not a lot of people doing the security and misconfiguration tests. Uh, just yet either. Um, yeah, looking through the chat. Um, so people just starting, so they're not doing a whole lot yet. Lots of things about unit tests and CI CD tests. We've got some more questions about that too. We've got, we've got more testing uh, in, uh, built in here. So one person who's writing uh, Golang unit tests. Um, so I think there was a tool, uh, DJ, that you had pointed out that uses Go as its... Uh, there was. Uh... Kitchen. Whether I can remember it or not, I, I can't. Uh, no. How about the, 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 the person that's writing the Golang test maybe can uh, save me from my poor memory and uh, throw in the chat uh, what they're using. It's, it's encouraging that there is this level of testing. And for the folks that aren't doing anything uh, yet, I would encourage them to, to encourage them to start. Um, and it can be something as simple as if you stood up a... Kubernetes cluster or whatever, um, just throw a curl at it. You don't have to be an application developer to be able to start writing tests that prove or give you a greater confidence that the systems that you're deploying uh, really work. Um, yeah. Particularly when it, particularly when it's uh, you're looking at kind of 
things later in the cycle, like integration test system tests, where there's a thing that actually exists. And then you can use, uh, if you're an operator, your shell scripting skills, you know, using things like curl or write, write a bit of bash um, or break out into a programming language. If that's, uh, you know, something that you're familiar with, it's uh, starting would be uh, highly encouraged. And is there a kind of a preferred ordering here as well? I see that like using things like IC foundations, like TerraTest is high percentage in like security, but I can see pros and cons for which way around they would like be in your pipeline as well. Like if you have a view on that, Dan, like should, should I be running TerraTest before I run some security tools or should it be the way around? Oh, that, no, that, that's a good question. Um, it, with that particular example, generally the, the the rule of thumb is you want to learn as quickly as possible, as quickly and as cheaply as possible. So you've got to think about how long those tests are taking to run. If they take a long time to run, um, then you probably want them further down the pipeline. So not shifted quite as far left as the quick and cheap things. So if you can get a, a rough indication of, of what's wrong very quickly, uh, then you should do that. And I think in the book, uh, I'm not sure whether we talk about it today, but in the book, we talk about using uh, pre-commit hooks. So uh, somebody has, uh, mentioned in the chat that they had uh, moved to a mono repo, which allowed them to uh, consolidate their pre-commit hooks. Pre-commit hooks are a feature of Git where when you do Git commit and you snapshot in time saying that, you know, this is a version that I, I want to record, Git will then uh, execute uh, another uh, process, um, another executable on your machine. And if that fails, then it won't proceed with the commit. So you can use that to execute a, a quick shell script that maybe does the linting, um, those kind of quick uh, tests that you can do. The uh, the sneak uh, IAC uh, testing tool, how, how quickly does that kind of turn around results? Um, some of our benchmarking is like 500 kind of files. It was like under 10 seconds, for example, running over, I think it was a native US example. So I was running over like 150 tests as well against each of those files. So I think um, pretty quick. We've got a lot of customers who run it around kind of the IDE, local development type stage, just within a feedback loop. Yeah, and, and with that kind of turnaround time, um, it depends on how how, uh, how small your commits are. If you're committing uh, every two or three minutes, then a 10 second hit's probably uh, not that great. But I would have thought with infrastructure, especially um, where there's maybe less refactoring that's going on, um, then if you're making a commit every half hour, 10 seconds is nothing. And if you can find that out before you commit and before you then push it and share it with somebody else, um, then you're also saving any downstream uh, time wasting. And whether that's if you're doing continuous delivery and trunk based development and kind of polluting uh, the, the main branch, or whether it's raising a PR that's going to fail because somebody else will have spotted this thing or the CI server will have spotted the thing. If you can spot that you've uh, missed something sooner, then you absolutely should. Yeah, I think, you know, with Sneak I see the other side of it too. It depends on what you're testing, right? I think. If you're if you just run a test over the whole repo, even though you've only made a change to one file, then that obviously takes a little longer. If you just want to test the one file you changed, then that's a little bit faster. Um, but I think you know most people just set up a test and you know, what they just test whatever. So it either way it can be done. But a few names did come up in the chat. So Terra Test was mentioned several times. Um, uh, Task Cat for cloud formation, which I haven't heard of, so I have to look that one up later. And Cucumber, somebody mentioned Cucumber. I don't know if that's like a real thing or. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a real thing. And that's very interesting. It was one of the curiosities I had, and I was trying to work out what to ask about, was, uh, there's my ankle again, I don't know whether you heard that. Um, the often, so one of the ways that we like to test systems and encourage our customers to test them is, do you know what feature it is that you're delivering? Is, and when the work came to your team, was it transmogrify the widget, reticulate the splines without uh, uh, an explanation of intent of why you're doing that and what someone can do with the system now that they couldn't do previously? If you are fortunate enough to work in a world where your work is expressed as user value, that makes testing a hell of a lot easier and gives you a kind of... Um, uh, a, a bit of protection later down the line of... If the story is that uh, customers can now search for cats on the front page, um, if you write a test that proves that that's happening, not only do you prove that you've enabled that feature the first time you write it, but then you can be running those against your running system 
constantly to find out whether there have been any regressions. And whilst that, uh, that, that particular example is very kind of user facing, customer facing, you could also be doing that with things like security um, and making sure that you know, the, the production database is not accessible from these kind of subnets. And once you start building up that suite, not only do you have uh, protection against change when you're knowingly making change, but you also have protection against change when somebody else is making it and maybe you don't want them to be. And I think we kind of touch on that a little bit later with uh, configuration drift. Well, we certainly yeah. touch on it in the book. Yeah. I think that touches a little bit on the policy question in the chat as well around should you be doing security validation as a pre-check or should you be doing it as a post-check? I think mean, there's always a bit of an it depends answer. But for me, it's, um, I always strive to kind of do both. Because Dan talks about you want that fast feedback, pre-check, get it early, but equally you want that confidence as well. That with Dan talking about drift, but you're still in that desired state as well. Let's go to our next question. This one's this one's always interesting as well, and it's I think I, I'm a little bit surprised at how often this happens. But for the folks uh, who are who are attending today, you know, if you're using infrastructure as code, in theory at least, all of your changes should be done in code and then deployed through your pipelines or whatever IAC deployment method you have. But but how many how often I guess are changes still being done? outside of those pipelines or think of it this way how many how many of those changes are still being done manually so you've deployed something via IAC and then somebody logs into your AWS console and manually changes something uh, usually it's you know, quote unquote temporary and I think it'd be interesting to see the, the split between zero and any other answer um, you know the uh, it's an interesting world when you can say to compliance and security folks that no one can make changes to production systems unless there's a break glass procedure. None of us have any access. The only thing that has access is the CI server, um, unless we go through this particular process where we get short-lived credentials and it's logged and it's audited and we had to put in a reason why. That then opens up a world where things like continuous delivery and much more rapid delivery of change is uh, much more palatable to, to the folks that are, you know, historically painted as the ministry of no. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as we're seeing the responses come in here too. So it's, there's a fairly good percentage of folks who only allow changes through the pipeline, still 25%, right? So that implies that 75% of the people still have changes that are coming outside of those pipelines. Um, now, it's a relatively low number. I'll go ahead and end this because we're, we're kind of centralizing on the answers. Let everybody see what's showing up here. Um, so, but, you know, that's still a lot. 75%, 70, over 75% of changes, or like it's not of the changes, but over 75% of folks are still seeing changes made outside the pipeline. So it is a significant, uh, a significant number. And I guess that begs the question, you know, there's a need for some sort of auditing of those, right? Of knowing what's going on because it's happening outside of version control, right? Um, so I wonder how people do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm working with a customer at the moment um, who has grown very, very quickly and uh, their platform team is uh, massively kind of overloaded with work. And so app developers are making changes to Terraform code, applying it themselves. And that's uh, kind of leading to some confusion. But then when that doesn't work, they're going in and manually changing things through the AWS console, at which point all bets are off. Like some poor, uh, you know, first line support person or second line support person has to log into the system. They've got no idea what state it's in. Some change could be made manually by a human and that makes the debugging process so much uh, more painful. Um, so that kind of thing, definitely to, to, to be avoided. I think uh, Catherine uh, uh, raised a good point about having a rule that anything that's done manually, then backporting it to be um, captured by the IAC configuration. You know, some, I think we mentioned this in the book. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd forgotten about Perry. We've got a fictional character called Perry, who's a, uh, a, a system admin, DevOps type person who's going on this journey. And I think Perry had to uh, make some manual fixes when something went wrong. Sometimes there are those situations where you've got to dive in, make a fix um, in order to save the day. 
but then it needs backporting. And I can think certainly of one customer that we worked with a good few years ago now where something happened on the weekend. People were up all night. They fixed it about four in the morning. And of course, they're like, oh, right, I'll, I'll put that in version control in the morning. They didn't. They forgot about it. And then, uh, you know, uh, the next change rolled through the pipeline, undid what they'd previously done. The production issue happened again. So that kind of um, discipline and rigor is, is really important. And if you have a CI pipeline that, you know, does all the quality checks on your infrastructure as code, does those deployments, does promotion, does all of those kind of good things, and does it in a reasonable amount of time, ideally without any manual checks because those are the death of uh, you know continuous delivery and getting things done quickly. If you've got a CI pipeline that can get things into production quickly, that's a, a great enabler of being able to fix things the right way rather than manually changing um, a, a live running production system. Once you've figured out what the fix is, don't do it through the UI, don't do it through, do it through the CLI, commit it and git, wait 20 minutes if you can, um, and then see it gone out permanently and see all the tests pass, which is, you know, another thing that you don't necessarily get when you're diving in and fixing things uh, manually. Yeah, I think Carlos had a good comment uh, in the chat panel too. Large percentage of the manual use is due to the mechanism or flow of change in companies. And I think it, that kind of relates back to, this is how we've done it in the past. This is how we did infrastructure and made changes in the past. And now that everything is code, well, some people don't know that it's code. Some people don't know what to do if it is code. Or where to go to make changes, and I think that's one of the reasons I think we we really wanted to write this book. Um, there, are, you know, if we're talking about Terraform. HashiCorp has great tutorials on how to, you know, how to do Terraform, how to write Terraform, and learning Terraform and those kinds of things. But I think these practices around treating it as code and getting everybody in the company to kind of think of it as code, um, the way you would other things, right? It's kind of a new class of developers in a way. I think a lot of infrastructure folks come from you know, a, a background where maybe they developed scripts, <laughs> things that they wrote just to kind of make their tedious jobs easier. And this is, a, you know, a big, big leap forward, I think, or can, can be if, if done. Um, Absolutely. It, it's when done well, it's transformative. And one of the totally echo your sentiment, Jim, there, that this is one of the reasons we were so keen to work together on the book. I would hope if, if you're one of the folks uh, listening to this and you think that, um, your, you know, the, the people higher in the food chain are not going to let you do this and that you're never going to be continuously uh, deploying into production. I would really hope that if there's one thing that we managed to achieve with the book, it's that uh, we can open up some minds. And there's, there's actually some sections in there that are not just about the practices. There's a few kind of small chapters about making the case uh, for safety at speed and making the case for all of these automotive processes because, yeah, linking my fingers synergistically, all of this stuff working together has way more impact than just one or two practices. If you can do one or two things and, and get incrementally better, absolutely do it. Don't think it's all or nothing. But when you do do it all together, then it opens up all of these different possibilities of different ways of working. And then you get into the fun world of digital transformation and realizing that, you know, the compliance and the governance people can't move as quickly as your infrastructure can. But what a great position to be in. <laughs> That's a good point, too. Uh, let's go to the uh, the next question. This one's kind of interesting too because I think this is a this is a this is a challenge probably overall. I would imagine this is a challenge for any kind of code. But you know, for IEC, if you if you are running these things, you know, through through pipelines, can you predict the outcome? Do you will you get the same result every time you run the same code through it um, or item potents if you want to use the big fancy uh, term that uh, that DJ put in the book? Um, is your code uh, is your infrastructure's code item potent? Can you predict what's going to happen reliably? Uh, and you put a couple examples in the book, DJ, of, of things that would sort of break that. Um, one was, I think, uh, you know, it was a, just a simple toggle, you know. And if it's a simple toggle, you won't know, you know, if it's if you started out with yes and you toggle it, your answer will be no. And if you started with no, your you toggle your answer will be yes. Well, then therefore, it's not predictable, right? Absolutely. I've just corrected a typo on this slide. So if you want to hit refresh, um, we can do that. Um, yes. So idempotence, or I've got a colleague that pronounce it idempotence, um, which I find slightly mind bending. Um, but yes, the, the knowledge that uh, you can run the same scripts, run the same stages in your CI pipeline um, several times, and they'll do exactly the same thing. 
Um, that's absolutely key. And you tend to find this more in, I mean, Terraform itself should be idempotent and convergent. You declare your state, Terraform will figure out what do I need to do to get to that state. And if there are no changes, it shouldn't do anything. Occasionally you come across a buggy uh, provider um, and you'll know about that because something bad will happen. But often it's the scripts that people write supporting things. So for example, we're big fans of having a pipeline that does everything to stand up a new environment from uh, absolutely nothing to uh, you know the full thing running and, and fully tested. If you're going to do that, where do you store your Terraform state? Um, you know, if you're going to store it in an S3 bucket, then you will need a bucket to exist before you run your Terraform. Otherwise, it won't have anywhere to put its state and to check where the state exists. So that's the kind of task that often ends up at the very beginning of a pipeline that is often shell scripted. And so you need to take some uh, care when writing those kind of things as to does the script fail if the bucket already exists? I'm pretty sure the AWS CLI um, will return an error if you try creating a bucket that's already there. So then you need to start wrapping that in checks. Um, either you disregard error messages, which is a bit dangerous um, because how do you know that you're disregarding the right error message? Maybe it's an authentication error rather than an error of the bucket already existing. Uh, or you, you defensively check. Like if the bucket doesn't exist, then uh, create it. And if it does exist, then just no op and we'll assume that everything's fine. And we sometimes see that with credential creation as well of um, you know scripts that might uh, create SSH keys, um, key pairs, certificates, those sorts of things where they'll, they'll generate a new one every time they're run, which is not necessarily uh, what you want. So having some awareness of that when you are start scripting something, especially if you're new to doing it continuously through a pipeline where the pipeline will be running at uh, times maybe you don't expect um, because your colleagues have uh, committed a change. Making sure that you've got that idempotence is uh, really key to having a, a stable system and a happy life where unexpected things uh, don't happen. Nobody likes unexpected things happening to their production systems. How big of an assumption is there in here as well that your infrastructure is stable and reliable in order to kind of underpin that uh, item potence? Yeah, I mean, that, that that's helpful if your uh, infrastructure is stable and, and reliable. If it's not, um, it's not quite the same as item potence. I think that's technically re-entrance, the idea that if you do something, if you, if you start a task, it fails halfway through, and then you run it again, that it will be able to, like, correct or resume where the last one ran off. That's also a, um, a, a desirable property of, of a system. Just looking through some of the uh, things in chat. I've got Carlos, if you use GitOps to trigger changes from repos to infra with Terraform, theoretically should be not to deploy anything right. Uh, I think that that's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Carlos, but that's talking about the kind of no-op idea, the no operation idea, that if you continually reapply your Terraform, Terraform should be smart enough to go, there's nothing to do here. It, it, it will be safe and it will have the, the same result. Uh, and generally you can rely on that contract with Terraform. If you can't, that means there's a bug in one of the providers that you're using, which we've experienced and uh, wasn't much fun. But oh, I just remembered another like really big point here. Don't depend on latest ever. Like, don't, don't be tracking, uh, uh, maybe we'll talk about this if we get to promotion, which is in the book and about promoting change through environments. Um, but definitely don't be depending on uh, the latest tag of container images. Uh, that is an example of a non item potent system. You run it one day, you get one result, you run it the next day, the, the latest version of that container image has changed and all of a sudden your system is behaving differently. There's a new version of a CLI in the image that you relied on in the script. Um, bad times are had by everybody. So you've got item potence in declarative convergent tools like Terraform where you shouldn't have to worry about it. You've got item potence that you need to design into your scripts and anything that you, you execute, anything procedural to make sure that you're um, you know, having the same effect when you run several times. But then also in terms of your dependencies, can you reproduce this? Um, can, can, will it do the same thing from one day to the next day? Um, and do you want it to? Uh, 
you know, you, you ideally want to be keeping the same versions of everything until you've decided that there's uh, a new change that you want to consume or that you uh, have a development pipeline that's pulling in all the changes and then promoting those through. Yeah, that actually leads to the next question. I'm going to make a note to before we publish, I need to add item potentance to the glossary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but moving on, there's actually this next question um, applies to some of those scenarios, right? So the idea of reapplying your infrastructure as code, even if there are no changes. So I think Carlos's comment was about, um, you know, if if there are no changes, then nothing should be applied, right? Um, but I think that's sort of the end, the, the last step, but that doesn't necessarily mean you don't kick off your pipeline anyway, just to, just to you know, sort of force that that uh, check, right? I'd, I'd be curious here, like, do we consider rotating credentials a change? As, so is that a deployment or a triggering rotation of credentials by making a clean deployment separate things? That makes sense. Okay, let's, let's remind me to come back to the, the credentials points. Um, the we want to minimize uh, configuration drift uh, by continually applying these things so that you don't get a surprise when you haven't made any code changes for a long time and then you run something and it all breaks. So, you know, th there's the, the longer it is between the runs of your CI pipeline and the application of your IAC, um, the, the more chance there is of something having changed, whether that's something on the inside of, of the pipeline of like this new version of something and maybe there's a new version of a Terraform provider that's behaving slightly differently and you didn't have a lock. Um, or um, there could be a new change in the environment where someone's gone in and made one of those manual changes. That uh, could then ca cause your uh, deployment to fail. So that's one set of things we want to protect against. Um, and then we also need to think about the, uh, by continually reapplying our IAC, if we trust it to be item potent, we trust it to be convergent, then that's protection against uh, attackers. That's a protection against people going in and trying to change things without you realizing. If there's a, um, a, a maximum amount of time that a VM can live for before it gets repaved. Um, if there's a maximum amount of time that uh, a VPC can be configured for before it gets totally reset, then any uh, attack has a limited shelf life. It's only going to be able to exploit things for a certain amount of time. I think, I can't remember which security person it was I was talking to, um, but they were saying, you know, the nightmare scenario is not that you have a vulnerability in an exploit, it's that you've had a vulnerability in an exploit that's been sat unnoticed for three years and has been slowly harvesting data. And then after three years, decides to splurge it all out um, at once where you haven't been detecting it. Um, so th that continual reapplication um, yeah. that is important there. Kind of the angle I was thinking about from is because like that meantime to recovery here of if you know there's a security incident and you the fix is to rotate your credentials like how easily and cleanly can you do that like do you have to make another change in order to do that or can you roll something like this forwards and just trust that on every deploy your creds change anyway and that's how you kind of resolve the incident. Sure, sure. Um, and and yes, we ideally want a situation where you can just rotate creds without having to make code changes necessarily, and the CI system picks that up. It was one of the points where we got to in the book where this really does start to depend on the things around you, um, which uh, secrets manager are you using? Are you using a secrets manager? It was one of the things that when we asked for barriers, um, secrets I saw uh, being listed uh, as a challenge there. So if you're using something like Vaults, um, you know, your life will be much easier. Tying this into a comment that I saw scrolling past in the chat, uh, Antonin uh, said that versions have to be configurable so you can decide when to upgrade uh, and test it through your environments, going to the last point. Some CI servers make it very difficult to notice when the outside world changes and bring new versions of things in and related to secrets changing and then uh, your CI server noticing, oh, there's a new version of the secret in Vault, I should probably apply it. Um, there are other CI servers that make this much easier. Um, I'm going to name drop Concourse because we rather like it and it makes these things um, very much easier. We've been looking at Tecton, we've been looking at Argo, we've been looking at Argo workflow, and none of them have an inbuilt polling mechanism um, and uh, kind of version tracking of new things that come through. They can do webhooks, but if you're in an enterprise environment, 
that's not very much use to you uh, if you need to react to change in the outside world, for example, Helm charts or uh, container image registries like Docker Hub. Um, so having a CI/CD system that can track changes, including those in credentials, and then take make take an action as a result of things in the outside world changing, things that you depend on changing, that's a good place to be in. At that point, you've got a living, breathing system that doesn't need manually updating by a human. Yeah, it looks like roughly two thirds of, of of the folks are doing it at least ad hoc. They're, they're kind of reapplying it, but. Uh, actually, that's not, I'm not reading that wrong. Uh, actually, it's flipped around. I guess, I guess it's about two thirds if I add it the other way. Uh, my math is still right. Um, so it looks like about two thirds of people are doing some sort of re reapplication, um, but a lot of it's manual, it looks like, uh, too. There's only a few that are actually doing this often and automatically, uh, which is interesting. And I think, you know, again, it ties back to what we talked about before. There's, there's a handful of people who have everything and don't allow any changes outside the pipelines and then are retesting everything automatically. Um, so interesting results there. There was a question here too on the earlier, the last one, you know, if you're not using something like latest, how do you automate security updates? Um, so if you don't, like if, if, if you, if everything is item potent and you know exactly what you're going to get at the end, then how do you, how do you know when there's a security update and how do you automatically make that change? So something is going to be different, right? Sure, sure. That's a, another really good question. Um, so again, this is where we had to make design choices in the book as how we were going to tackle this. We decided to use Jenkins as the CICD system uh, of choice because it's kind of like the lingua franca of CICD. And Jenkins makes this reasonably difficult, to be honest. It's got no inbuilt mechanism for tracking things in the outside world. And then you're into the realm of like writing scripts that will replace bits of uh, stuff in, in YAML. Um, so you've got solutions like that where you have to hand crank something, um, which if you've got no other choice, you should absolutely do. Like what, what you want is a series of pipelines where your dev pipeline not only listens to changes that you make, it listens to changes in the outside world. Every time there's a new version of a, a new image, you want a CI CD system that can pick that up, go, ooh, there's a new version of this dependency. Let's now run that through the pipeline so that if it passes all the tests, that automatically goes through and you're always on the latest version of everything. Some people might have a kind of uh, different views about that and about maybe not being on the latest version of things. What was that old thing about like people saying, don't use a new version of Windows for a year and a half? Um, that was in the old days. But uh, certainly uh, having a CICD system that can, that can detect those changes and update things for you. In a decentralized GitOps model, I think this becomes harder. Um, I think when you've got lots of different uh, things deployed in a cluster and lots of different dependencies being watched and that's not fed through a central mechanism of tracking all change, that can be um, challenging to reason about. In the book, we talk about creating a bill of materials. Um, so taking the point of view that you're working on a system, a product, what were the versions of all of the things that went into this run of the pipeline um, and pass the tests. And then you can provide that to your next pipeline, like your staging environment or your UAT, uh, and deploy all of those versions. There's, there's a tension there in um, who is deploying stuff here. Like if you're creating an internal developer platform, that, that point of view makes perfect sense um, because you, you want to control all the things going into your platform. But if you're deploying, if you're responsible for deploying all of the app developers apps, and the, you know, the various microservices that you've got going on at your organization, then that starts to break apart a bit. And we're kind of back into a similar sort of discussion about monorepos versus uh, separate repositories about where do the boundaries lie and who should be updating what, when, on what kind of cadence. And do we want to know that absolutely everything, the version of absolutely everything um, on, on this platform works in unison or would that be excessive coupling and would that slow your organization down? If you're Netflix or Amazon, you've got no chance of doing that, of knowing that all of these services all work together all at once. And that's not the design intention behind those organizations either. But if you've got 20, 30 microservices and it takes 20 minutes to chain, uh, to test all of them working together, and the changes don't come through that quickly, and you don't need to make changes more than once every half hour in, in production, then uh, why wouldn't you want to have all of that confidence that everything works all at the same time? 
Yep, and that uh, will get us into the next question. I will put in one more shameless plug as the sneak marketing person on this call. Uh, if you had a security tool that told you what changes to make, right, um, to be more secure, then you could probably take that another step further. Uh, and it just so happens that we have security tools that do exactly that. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a potential to do something like that, but it would require, you know, whatever security tools you do use, hopefully it's sneak, and hopefully you're looking at sneak, but whatever tools you use, um, to kind of tell you, look, there's a, here's a security problem. Here is the thing you do to fix it. And then you could take that. And if you really wanted to get, you know, wave the magic wand and just say, okay, we're going to automatically jump to this next version. Then, you know, that's, that's a potential. I know very few customers who are at that level of automation with security fixes. Um, but I, th I think it's inevitable. You look at things like depender bots that will raise PRs against your uh, repos whenever there's a, a potential misconfiguration. Um, that's bound to spread to infrastructure at some point. And having a CI/CD pipeline all the way to prod means that you're going to be getting security fixes faster than your competitors. Yep, exactly. Okay, so you mentioned the, the bill of materials. We have a question about that too. And this will probably be the last poll question we get to, I think. Um, but do you track and record which versions uh, of your IAC uh, and all the other components that are part of that work together. So are you creating that IAC bill of materials? And you might be doing this manually. Um, you, you run it through the tests and maybe it's a script or something that you've kind of written, um, or you might be, you might be using a, a, you know, tools that can just dynamically generate all of this for you. I think to your point, DJ, having a list, a record of things that have been tested together that are known to work together, um, you know, is good for a lot of reasons, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, um, and the, the answers to this, they're legitimately uh, good answers, uh, different good answers, depending on your use case. Thinking of a customer of ours um, who we've written about in uh, our blog doing some really cool, really demanding infrastructure as code stuff that was like in a regulated environment behind an air gap. That was lots of fun. Um, thinking about their setup, uh, Having the, 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 the chap there, the, the SVP of uh, technology talks about fleet management and they've got, the, it's a software as a service, but they need to have some single tenant instances. So they've got, you know, kind of 30 uh, ish microservices um, that provide their product about 10, 15 data services. So, you know, you name it, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, Kafka, Redis, Postgres, the whole kit and caboodle, uh, Apache Storm, uh, Zookeeper. They, and that whole thing provides their product suite. And they've got some that are public cloud, multi-tenant, some that are on-premises and single tenant. They need to be able to roll out changes to the apps and the microservices and then have those go out to all of the different places. They need to be able to say, all right, we need a new version of Apache Storm here. And doing all of that manually and or doing it with a non-automated process is an absolute, uh, it was killing them um, in terms of productivity. But when they moved to a uh, nice promotion process, where it's like, right, we're going to keep track of everything that goes into the, our first environment. When it comes out, then we're going to write that to a YAML file, which we'll then use to parameterize values in other YAML files, because everything's YAML now. Um, and then we can see that set of versions go all the way through our, our promotion pipeline. And now we can see how the progressive rollout has worked across our multiple um, different production environments for different customers. That allowed them to reason about the system in a way that they couldn't do before. Before it was heterogeneous. Uh, there were things deployed in all different places and different versions of this and different versions of that, which is a problem I'm uh, helping another customer at the moment tackle of that not having a centralized process for change management and the kind of recording of, of versions that work together. It makes debugging easier. Um, when you've got a live production issue, you know exactly where you stand and you can go, well, this bunch of stuff worked in 27 other environments. Why isn't it working in this one? It must be something to do with this environment. Uh, it's better for security and compliance in that you can uh, you know, know exactly what it is that you've got in there and you can prove it because it's in Git somewhere. Um, yeah, it, I, I think it makes for a, a much easier life. You have to be, you know, think about where those boundaries are and what you want to couple and what you don't want to couple. Um, but there will be natural boundaries of things like this bunch of stuff changes together. Therefore, we should track all of these versions at once so we can know for sure this bunch of stuff work together. Yeah, and there's a, there's a question here too. Carlos, I don't, 
maybe I don't, I don't understand the question. What use case? So he, he said, I understand that, you know, you should do this. You should track all these versions, you know, for things like recovery, DR, those sorts of things, right? Or if somebody just wants to fully deploy from scratch, I guess. Uh, but what what use case you have for tracking IEC and app versions? I don't know. Like oh, I, I get it. And I love the question. I think it's a really good one. And it talks a really good point. The depending on your product and your use case, there may not be a clear abstraction between infrastructure and apps. Some places there are, there's a really good platform boundary where it's like, we're the platform team or the infrastructure team. You can self-service, push your app code here. If your app doesn't work, well, good luck to you. Um, you know, that's yours to figure out. We give you the self-service tools to figure that out. If the platform doesn't work, then that's our problem. And you come to us and raise a ticket. That's one model of working, which to be honest, we do not see very often. The level of sophistication in platform teams is surprisingly uh, kind of behind the curve on that. Instead, we end up with this mishmash of like infrastructure and apps. If you've got a thousand app teams and one infrastructure team, um, then it doesn't make sense to check that all of these apps work with this version of infrastructure. But in that, so the example I was talking about earlier where you've got like 30, 40 microservices, if your product that end users are getting value from doesn't work unless all of those things work together, then you should be testing those in lockstep and promoting those uh, in lockstep. If people can get value without all of that, then maybe there, there's less of, uh, less of a case for it. There's, uh, there was another point I was going to touch on there, but the... Do people get value from the whole or just part of it? Are you providing a platform or are you providing infrastructure to enable product features? And that's probably when you want to uh, track that these things work together. Ah, that was the other thing I was going to say. Platform updates underneath uh, underneath apps. Like the number of, oh, this has got worse in the era of Kubernetes. The number of customers that I go to saying, well, there was an outage because we did a, a cluster upgrade. Like, great. Why isn't anyone testing that? And there's various different reasons, but you need to know that even if you do have a platform boundary and you're a platform team and there's an abstraction, you need to know that this bunch of apps works on this version of the platform and that needs to be tested separately before you go making that change in production. I'm rabbiting on. If you want to continue the conversation on Twitter with me, it's Daniel Jones EB um, and I can continue rabbiting on there. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, we're right at the, the top of the hour. So I do want to thank everybody for uh, for your participation today. This it's great. We love when we get on here and people actually participate because it gives us more to talk about. Um, and we learn a lot from that as well. Um, the book, somebody asked in the, in the uh, chat, what's the name of the book? Um, it, it's uh, We're going to release the book, I'm hoping this week, if not this week, next week, uh, and we'll send it out. It's currently called Continuous delivery for infrastructure as code, but I'm in the middle of a title change to infrastructure as code for, for security and speed, but either way, it's the same content. Um, so we'll be releasing that um, ASAP and we will send it out if you've signed up for this webinar and you opted in for follow-ups, we'll, we'll send that out. If you haven't opted in for follow-ups, for follow you can check out the sneak page. These links here um, will take you to the sneak page and go to the sneak IEC page. If you, you know, Engineer Better uh, did a lot of the work here, and I want to thank DJ and his his team for um, for the you know really the the bulk of the work that went into this book. Um, and you know if you have questions about implementations and you want some help with implementations, uh, the Engineer Better team is you know is fantastic. Um, and so please do you know reach out to them as well and you know get them involved in your projects. But thanks again, everybody. Thanks DJ. Thanks Ben. Thanks Sarah. Thanks Marissa and the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, and we will chat with everybody again soon. Have a great one. See ya. Thanks so much, folks. Take Bye. care. Thank you, everyone. As a quick reminder, this uh, recording will be posted on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. Thank you.